Hey, welcome to Capture and Christianity. Today we're asking artificial intelligence to prove or disprove God's existence. I've got with me my friend Joe Schmid from The Majesty of Reason, his YouTube channel. Once you go check it out, if you've never heard of Majesty of Reason, you need to go check it out. But uh, this is going to be more like a lighter stream. It's going to be fun and, you know, we're not taking this very seriously what a what uh, artificial intelligence can can say about God's existence and uh, we're gonna have some fun along the way like gonna put in some uh, some funny prompts I'm sure that Joe you've you've come up like we tried to come up with some like good prompts to to give the uh, chat GT, GPT um, but we'll see what happens we'll see what happens but Joe uh, th today is actually Christmas so for, if you're watching this in the future, we are recording this on Christmas Day, so uh, Merry Christmas, Joe. How was uh, Merry, how was your Merry, Christmas? Merry Science Miss to you. Uh, it's a very <laughs> wonderful holiday season here. Um, yeah, my Christmas was wonderful. I was spending time with the family and things like that. Um, I hope yours was wonderful as well. Yeah, yeah, we uh, did what we always do. I I, I wake up a, a little bit early and make pancakes and bacon for everyone, and then we open gifts and just hang out, and then we went. I think uh, for lunch, or my wife's parents made food, so we like went over there and hung out for a little while. And now we're back here doing a stream about artificial intelligence proving God's existence. So, pretty good day overall. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Okay, let's get well, into it. Let's just uh, let me pull up my. I was gonna say some of mine are a little bit more serious, but others are a little bit more funny. So well, it's a good mixture. I'm looking forward to this. Okay. Uh, oh, let me also say this. So we're using, this is like newer technology. I think that just came out chat GPT. If you'd like to do some of these yourself and have some fun, uh, you can just go to, uh, hang on a second. Let me <laughs> fix this real quick. Okay. There we go. Uh, sorry. I'm like a stickler about things looking right on the screen. Uh, you, I've got a link to in the description to this website. If you want to like go and do your own prompts and have some fun yourself. But uh, what we're doing today is just some things that Joe and I came up with. So let's, I'll start with the first one. Um, th this is the thumbnail for the video for today is just straight up, does God exist? We'll plug that in and see what happens. For, from what I understand, like these are supposed to be unique every time that you put it. So if like you did, God, does God exist? Like, you know, three or four times each time you're going to get a different answer in that. Is that correct? I you think may know so. about you may more may know more about this than I do. I think you're supposed to get different answers. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's just see what happens. All right. Here's the first one. The existence of a deity or higher power is a matter of belief and faith, and different people have different beliefs about this. Some people believe in the existence of a single god or goddess, while others believe in multiple deities or a higher power that is not necessarily associated. With any particular religion or belief system, some people do not believe in the existence of a deity or higher, higher power at all. Ultimately, the existence of a deity or higher power is a question that cannot be definitively answered based on empirical evidence or scientific study, and people must come to their own conclusions about it based on their own experiences, personal beliefs, and values. So, kind of, kind of like New Agey, almost uh, like there's, there's uh, almost <laughs> like a science, scientism, like kind of going on beneath the surface too, like talking about what can be definitively proven based on empirical evidence or scientific study. It's like, who's, who actually made this up? Like how, how does, how did this be the end result of a question like this? Yeah, I don't know. I think what they do. So for the audience, I think what they did was like, you know, this is like a neural network or whatever. Right. So they like feed it a ton of data and it like sifts through it. And, uh, it like spits out its answers on the basis of sifting through a boatload of data. So I don't know too much about it. People in the audience probably know much more than I do, in fact. Um, but somehow it got to this answer, which doesn't even seem to answer the question. It's like, oh, well, you know, some people believe it. Some people don't. It's almost like uh, I'm, I'm surprised it didn't say this. What do you mean by do? What do you mean <laughs> by God? And what do you mean by exist? <laughs> uh, I, I, that, that would have been a truly fantastic answer oh goodness yeah that, no, that was a pretty good uh, peterson impersonation too. <laughs> well so uh so pretty good a... okay uh why don't we i mean is there anything else to say about this one i mean is a matter of belief in faith like how are you defining these terms or who who is like behind this ai that is defining these terms i don't know because 
can, can, can you just say that it's like a matter of what you think is most probable? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That was a kind of a, an unfortunate answer to that one, but we'll get, we'll get more juicy. We'll get juicier ones later. Okay. All okay. right. Well, give me uh, what's your, what's your first one? Okay. So start typing, get ready. This All is, right, this is one of more serious ones. This is one of the more serious ones. Okay. Offer a symmetry breaker in the what? Oh my on... goodness. Yeah. Offer a no. Let yeah. Okay. Well, let's just say offer a symmetry breaker in the modal ontological argument for God's existence. I can't spell today. <laughs> in the modal uh, ontological argument for God's existence. All right. Let's see what happens. Hmm. The modal ontological argument is a philosophical argument that attempts to prove the existence of a necessary being or a being that exists necessarily rather than contingently. The argument begins by considering all concept of a ne the concept of a necessary being, which is defined as a being that exists in all possible worlds. Oh, it's going too <laughs> fast. <laughs> I'll just have to wait for... Okay, there it is. All right, now it's finished. Uh, which is defined as a being that exists in all possible worlds. The argument then asserts that it is possible that a necessary... That it is possible that a necessary being exists and that it, if it is possible that a for a necessary being to exist, then it must actually exist. One way to challenge or break the symmetry, ooh, look at this, <laughs> of this argument might be to question the first premise, uh, which asserts that it is possible for a necessary being to exist. One might argue that the concept of a necessary being is itself problematic or contradictory and that it is not possible for such a being to exist. For example, one might argue that if a being exists necessarily, then it cannot have any causes or explanations for its existence, which seems to be a contradiction. Another way to challenge the argument might be to question the second premise, which asserts that if a necessary being is possible, then it must actually exist. One might argue that the concept of, a, of possibility does not necessarily entail actuality and that it is possible for something to be possible without actually existing. Denial of S5. There are many other ways that one could potentially challenge the modal ontological argument, and these are just a few examples, a couple examples. It is worth noting that the argument is a highly complex and controversial topic in philosophy, and there is ongoing debate about its validity and soundness. And soundness. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, firstly, I, I'm surprised that it's able to... Uh... Well, you know, it's using at least some of the concepts right, you know, like it says validity and soundness and it's like the first premise is this and the second premise is this and you could challenge either one. So I guess it's um, more coherent than what might be spewed forth on some internet forums, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of lame. Also, this one was also a little bit lame just because it didn't really understand the symmetry problem. And yeah. uh, there are some other weird things in there, but... Uh, the symmetry problem is is really about the first premise of the argument, whether or not it's possible that God exists. And so a symmetry breaker would, well, okay, let's back up. So in the ontological argument, you've got this premise, which is the key premise of it. May, most people think that it's the key premise and it's just, it's possible that God exists. And so one very typical response to this argument is to run what's called a reverse modal ontological argument where you say, well, okay, it's possible that God does not exist. And if that's possible, then it shows that God does not exist. And so what philosophers have then now turned to is like looking for ways to break the symmetry between the regular modal ontological argument and the reverse modal ontological argument. So there are various attempts at giving a breaker of the symmetry between these two competing premises. And that's, what this question is all about and it doesn't look like i mean uh, let me scroll back up here so like one way to break the symmetry might be to question the first premise uh which asserts that it's possible so and then it says one might argue that the concept of a necessary being is itself problematic or contradictory so that would actually constitute like a symmetry breaker if you if yeah, you could for the argue reversal. for the reversal right correct yeah so it it, it does actually get like that right at least i guess yeah yeah okay well that was an interesting one that was more serious on the serious end we could probably turn to one of yours now some of mine are uh, later on i i'm i'm curious about the next one of mine but let, let's go on to yours and i can actually read it uh if you want to read what well when, once you type it in i can read the answer out okay which one the second one the yeah, one that i'm about to put in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay and then I'll you're read. gonna read it this time yeah, yeah okay yeah. okay to, to kind of 
Okay, tell a funny story where William Lane Craig loses a debate to Richard Dawkins. <laughs> okay, dude, we almost okay. I, we almost had a similar one, but that's okay. All right, yeah. Let's see. Let's see what happens if we can tell a funny story. Oh, oh. no, no. Okay, sometimes, sometimes it let does. Let me remove this. funny. I'll yeah. just say I'll just remove funny. The the word okay. funny. Tell a story where William Lane Craig loses a debate. But should I add like religious debate? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Religious, religious debate to Richard Dawkins. Okay, let's see what happens now. Oh my goodness! Fictional stories. Okay, so sometimes you just have I've to seen plug it, it do in that a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just have to do it multiple times, and it'll like uh, it'll like it'll change it. it or something. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, you can just put in the same prompt uh, a few times, and sometimes it, it does it. So let's see. Ah, oh, still man. not. Let's do it one more time. Tell a story. No, just um, say here instead of saying tell a story about it because it, you know it's getting caught up mm -hmm. on the fictional story thing. Say something like uh, generate a debate where William Lane Craig loses to Richard Dawkins or something. Loses to Richard Dawkins. Yeah. <laughs> fictional debates fictional debates <laughs> wow it's a lot of everything okay um Gener a okay okay <laughs> where do we go from here? i can just move on i mean okay. i've got i've got way more prompts yeah. to go through Let, let's go with maybe mine. Let's go with mine okay yeah just tell me what yours is well it's not gonna be able to do this either okay write a heated debate between <laughs> a heated debate between William Lane Craig and Pope Francis on whether God is temporal. It's not going to do it. Man, I, dude, I've seen it do these things with other people. Oh, well. I know. It's not the mood. I've seen it it's too. Oh, wait. What is it? Oh, okay. Well, wait. What's happening? About the divine temporality. Uh, on the other hand, some philosophers and theologians argue that God is temporal, which means that God exists within time and is subject to change and alteration. Okay, it's just giving you the perspectives on it. Is there anything else I can help with? Hmm. <clears throat> let's uh, let's just let write me a ask, conversation. Write let me a conversation. Do this. Write a conversation? Yeah, just tell it to write a conversation between them. Because it's like it's I'm getting gonna, caught up on debate, maybe. I'm gonna do this. How did William Lane Craig first meet Richard Dawkins? Let's see what let's see if we can do this. <laughs> we broke it. Uh, we broke. Yes. We okay, let's 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 delete this chat. Yeah, maybe that's our problem. Let's get a new chat. Okay. Right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How did William Lane Craig? We're spending way too much time on this. We want it to work so bad. <laughs> I know. I know. Meet. Richard Dawkins. Let's see if we can break it again. I know the answer to uh, it. We broke it. I know the answer to this one. He met him at some debate that he was doing. It was like a, a debate between like three theists on the one hand and three atheists on the other hand. And then he met Richard Dawkins in like the lobby or something like that. Yeah. Have you heard this? Have you heard this story? I have not. Yeah. He met, he met Richard Dawkins and Richard Dawkins said something snarky to him. <laughs> and that's that's about it nice. um okay delete okay let, let's see if we can delete unable to load history i don't know what's happening do i just <laughs> let me just restart there you go write a conversation let, let's do like the write a conversation one okay we'll try yours write a conver conversation <laughs> <laughs> between Richard Do between William Lane Craig and Richard Dawkins on the existence of God yeah
All right. There we go. Still, it's catching it. It's like it knows, Joe. It knows. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> For those of you that are, that are just listening and not watching this, it's like now it's just like basically giving facts about Wayne Lane Craig and Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Mm. Well, another way you could put it is like I mean, simulate. It's... You can write simulate a dialogue. I've seen people right. write that and it's been able to... <laughs> I'm moving on. Wait. I'm moving yeah, on. My next one, my next one was simulate a dialogue between Baruch Spinoza and Joe Rogan on pantheism. That's not going to work. I, it like clearly knows if we're asking it to, to write a story now. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay, let's just let me let me do this one. What is the strongest argument for God's existence? All right, okay, read it. The existence of God is a highly debated and controversial topic, and there are many different arguments that have presented for and against the existence of God. It's not possible to determine definitively which argument is the strongest, as this is a matter of personal belief and interpretation. Different people may find different arguments more or less compelling, depending on their own experiences, values, and perspective. That being said, some of the arguments that have been presented as evidence for God's existence include the following. One, the cosmological argument, which asserts that the existence of the universe requires an explanation, and that the best explanation is the is the existence of a first cause or necessary being, that is, God. Two, the moral argument, which asserts that the existence of objective moral values and duties requires the existence of a moral lawgiver, that is, God. Three, the teleological argument, which asserts that the complexity and order of the natural world suggests the existence of a designing intelligence or creator, that is, God. Four, the ontological argument, which asserts that the concept of God as a necessary being, that is, a being that exists necessarily rather than contingently, is coherent and that therefore God must exist. It is worth noting that these arguments are not universally accepted and they've been challenged and debated by philosophers and theologians. Some people find these arguments persuasive while others don't. Ultimately, the question of God's existence is a complex and multifaceted one and different people will have different perspectives on it uh, based on their own experiences and beliefs. I mean, not too bad. Like it, it yeah, it's that not, not that bad. bad of an answer. It's, it's yeah. like trying to stay objective about it and like stay out of the, you know, the, the debate or whatever. So it's not, it's not that bad. Not that yeah, bad. Yeah. I mean, it should have just said the contingency thought. argument. Like it, if it just said that, then it could, the. Yeah. Then, then, then it would have been, you know, it, it just, it hasn't, it hasn't plugged in the scripts for the capturing Christianity videos that or the majesty of reason <laughs> videos as well. That's his yeah. problem. Or, um, the, uh, the recent psycho physical harmony argument. I mean, uh, did you did you watch the what's his name? Square apologist. What is his name? Apologi apologetic apologetic squared. squared. Ap apologetic squared. Did you watch his video on psychophysical harmony? I did. Yeah, yeah. It was it was well yeah. done. Did you uh, did you agree with his like? I mean, he thinks it's like the the greatest argument that's ever been made for the existence <laughs> I mean, I of God. I I think it's. I mean, I I don't think it's that strong, but I mean, I think it's. So my thoughts in it are actually you know being. Uh, developed and still kind of brewing so i mean i probably have sure. to think about it a little bit further uh, i have certain reservations here and there uh especially like how different views and philosophy of mind might have resources in in potentially responding but um they, they're all very incohate they're all very incohate uh responses so I, i'm trying to develop them further i'm actually talking with them um, uh well i've talked with a little bit about with dustin about this so um, yeah, yeah, and Dustin, like he doesn't claim he doesn't claim all the things that Apologetic Squared claims. Oh, definitely, the, yeah. The and I mean, yeah. Brian Cutter thinks like he, Brian Cutter is really sensitive to like high order evidence. You know, like philosophy is really difficult, and you know, mm -hmm. the, it's a just pub, paper that's just been published, and um, you know, like what are the, what's the probability that we've overlooked something, and you know, like this sort of high order evidence that can sort of decrease confidence pretty quickly. Um, I'm kind of like him in that regard as well. But as of yet, you would say. Going back to the question, it, you would you would agree that the contingency argument? Oh yeah. Oh no. no uh, contingency yeah, argument is stronger. Right now, yeah, by my lights, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm 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 pretty much there too. I think. Oh, um, let me, I should mention this. If you don't, if you've never been exposed to Joe Schmidt, he's actually an agnostic. So he thinks that the are the evidence is roughly counterbalanced on both sides. So he's not a theist. He's not a Christian. He's, he's a agnostic. So, all right. Uh, give me uh, your next prompt. 
Okay. Let, let, One that can try. actually work. We gotta try the simu. We, we somehow have to get a dialogue. They're, they're gonna be funny. Okay. Let's let's just try one more time. Simulate okay. a dialogue, and then between whoever you want. So simulate a dialogue between uh, whoever. Between <laughs> Matt Delahunty and Stephen Woodford. No. Okay, Tom Jump. <laughs> That is so happen. silly. I've seen it do this for other people. Okay. Oh, well. Oh. Now let's talk about Matt Dillon. Baptist minister. Okay. Pastor and Christian apologist. <laughs> who is Tom, known Jump. <laughs> Tom Jump is a pastor and Christian apologist who is known for his advocacy for the existence of God and the truth of the Christian faith. He is the author of several books and is engaged in numerous public uh, debates and discussions on topics uh, related to religion and faith. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's great that is good that, there's there's my Christmas present <laughs> you can ask it like who is Cameron Bertuzzi or like who is Joe Schmidt or something okay give me uh, let me let me do this too so if you have like a prompt that you'd like us to plug in then leave it in the live chat I can't pretend like I can't promise to read every single comment that gets thrown in but if you like I don't know tag tag me like at capturing Christianity that should help me like find the comments that are supposed to be about like prompts to, to try to plug in. So um, we have like a lot more that we have planned to plug in, but if you want to give us some ideas, then we're all ears or all eyes or whatever. Okay. Uh, do you want to give me another one? Cause that one didn't work. Yeah. Okay. This one will be fun uh, and we can actually talk about it. So uh, people can learn something as well. So, um, just say, give me five objections to the contingency argument for God's existence. Hmm. There we go. Okay, five objections. You can read this one. The contingency argument, also known as the cosmological argument, <laughs> is a philosophical argument that attempts to demonstrate the existence of God by inferring the existence of a necessary being from the contingency of the universe. Here are five objections that have been raised against the contingency argument. One, the argument relies on a questionable premise. The contingency argument relies on the premise that the universe or everything that exists is contingent or dependent on something else for its existence. That's false. I can't, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm waiting... For those of you just listening, I'm waiting for it to, to finish because it's it actually it is actually trying to give five objections. So this is this is good. This is good. Let's see what it, it actually gives. I've I'm stopped I, I've stopped reading so far. I'm just waiting to scroll back up. Okay, here we go. All right. So one, the argument relies on a questionable premise. The contingency argument relies on the premise of that the universe or everything that exists is contingent or dependent on something else for its existence. That is so false. Some philosophers have argued that this premise is questionable and that the universe may be self-explanatory or self-sufficient. If this is the case, then the argument would be undermined. Okay. Number two, the argument relies on an incomplete understanding of causation. The contingency argument relies on the idea that everything that exists must have a cause or explanation. <laughs> <sighs> However, some philosophers have argued that our understanding of causation is incomplete and that it is possible that some things exist without a cause or explanation. If this is the case, then the argument would be undermined. I'm noticing a undermined. The argument relies on a circular argument. Some critics of the contingency argument have argued that the argument relies on a circular argument in which the existence of God is assumed in order to explain the existence of the universe and then the existence of the universe <laughs> is used as evidence for the existence of God. This would be a logical fallacy and would undermine the argument. <laughs> the argument relies on an incomplete understanding of the nature of God. The contingency argument relies on the idea that God is a necessary being or a being that exists necessarily rather than contingently. However, some philosophers have argued that our understanding of the nature of God is incomplete and that it is possible that God exists contingently or that God's existence is not necessary. If this is the case, then the argument would be undermined. The argument relies on an incomplete understanding of the nature of reality. The contingency argument relies, does reality exist? The contingency argument relies in the idea that the universe is contingent and that everything that exists must have a cause or explanation. However, some philosophers have argued that our understanding of the nature of reality is incomplete. And that it is possible that there are aspects of reality that are beyond our current understanding and that do not fit within our current conceptual framework. If this is the case, then the argument would be undermined. 
It is worth noting that these are just a few examples of the many objections that have been raised against the contingency argument. And there is ongoing debate and discussion about the validity and soundness of this argument among philosophers and theologians. Well. So there you go. <laughs> that was a mixed bag. <laughs> well, Very I mixed. Guess it was mostly mostly uh, poor. Let's see, the first one, man, it's like it relies on a, everything is questionable or incomplete, I guess. So the questionable premise was what? That everything, everything that exists is contingent? <laughs> or dependent on something else for its existence? Yeah, it's like those aren't those aren't the same. I guess I guess we could, uh, you know, disentangle some of these concepts that the prompt is unfortunately Well, I mean, look at this. Like every, if, if the argument was that everything that exists is contingent, why would we be doing like a contingency argument? The contingency argument gets you to a non-contingent necessary thing. <laughs> so yeah, like, why well, would that, why would anyone include that as a premise? Everything that exists is contingent or dependent. It's so. You think, it that, kind you of, think that it'd be able to sift through like the philosophy papers better, but I guess not. Yeah. And an incomplete. Okay. Let's move on. An incomplete understanding of causation the contingency argument relies on the idea that everything that exists must have a cause or explanation. I get it's like the same thing. No, the argument does not include the premise that everything that exists must have a cause or explanation. Like that would obviously apply to whatever you want to call like God or whatever else. Yeah, whatever everything the that exists. Unexplained foundation of reality. Yeah. So uh, yeah, exactly. Incomplete so, understanding of causation. Uh See, that one might be okay, I guess, maybe. If you interpret like, it, yeah, if you interpret it the right way. <laughs> if you interpret it with, like, 30 degrees of charity instead of, uh, yeah. The next one is relies on a circular argument. That one was funny. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> God's existence is assumed. The right. argument relies on a circular argument. <laughs> it's not that, it, it's not, the objection is not that the argument itself is circular but that it relies on a circular argument. Some and critics then, of the contingency argument have argued that... Should we do one of the voices? Some critics needed. of the contingency yeah, yeah. argument have <laughs> argued that the argument relies on a circular argument in which the existence of God is assumed in order to explain the existence of the universe. And then <laughs> the existence of the universe is used as evidence for the existence of God. <laughs> Dandelions. Uh, <laughs> yes, I love shit dandelions. The <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, well, actually, the argument relies on an incomplete understanding of the nature of reality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reality isn't real. Reality may not exist. Okay, now, now number four is like it's the one that's not that terrible. one was interesting. Yeah, that was like super cool. I'm like, okay, like maybe maybe this chatbot is Red Swinburne. It's like. You know, there's, exactly. there's an interesting question to be had there. Like, does, like, if God were to exist, would he be necessary or would he be contingent? Like, you know, Richard Swinburne has fancy arguments for thinking that God would be contingent. So, yeah. So, so that one was fun. I like that one. Yeah, that one was good. And then the last one, like, was just ba like babble. It was nothing. Relies on an incomplete understanding yeah. of the nature of reality. <laughs> the contingency argument relies on the idea that the universe is contingent and that everything that exists must have a cause. That's like literally just repeating number two, first of all, yeah. and it's false. And then, however, some philosophers have argued that our understanding of the nature of reality is incomplete and that it is possible that there are aspects of reality that are beyond our current understanding and that do not fit within our current conceptual framework. That means nothing. <laughs> uh yeah that's a that's it, it's like fluff it's like when you uh it's like the yes. professors complaining about their undergraduate essays like the undergraduate they're like oh well this topic has been debated for a long time and there are various different answers to it and uh you know our maybe our con concepts don't apply you know things like that yeah yeah it is possible that there are aspects of reality that are beyond our current <laughs> understanding and that do yeah. not fit within our <laughs> current God is a contingent, and so the, the fourth uh, objection, that is to say, the one that comes after the, the third one, <laughs> has to be a, 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 a objection. So, <laughs> okay, I've got the best one. The next, my next one is the best one. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here it is. Who created, Who created God? God? 
Uh, nice. We'll see this. <laughs> of course, it just broke the system. <laughs> All right, let me uh, reload and see if it works after reloading. Go down, go down, go down, go down. Wow, we've done a lot here. Okay, let's start a new chat. Yeah. With this one. I think it's still going to break it. Nope. Oh, it worked. Okay. Yeah. The concept go of ahead. God is a complex and multifaceted one. Uh, and different cultures and belief systems have their own ideas about the nature and origin of God. In many religious traditions, God is seen as the creator of the universe and all that exists within it. Some people believe that God has always existed and was not created by anyone or anything, while others see God as a being who came into existence at some point in the past. In the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, God is often depicted as an eternal, all-knowing, and all-powerful being who created the universe and all living things. In Hinduism, God is seen as the ultimate reality and the source of all existence and is believed to be eternal and unchanging. Ultimately, Ultimately, the concept of God and the beliefs about God's nature and origin are matters of personal faith and interpretation, and people may hold a wide range of views on these matters. So, not too bad. Yeah. Kind of a plain vanilla response. Yes. Yes. Very vanilla. They need to, they need to program it with a little bit more spice. Like, they need, you know, it needs to come up with something like... Like, all it needed to say, all it needed to say was EXACTLY in all caps, period. <laughs> Who created God I've been a exactly for, for 15 years, 40 years? <laughs> no, 20 years. 20 years, dang it. I've been a chatbot for 20 years. Yeah, I've been studying this. You can't, Bring you it. can't, you can't. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> Bring it. Okay, uh, give me your next one. <laughs> Bring your next one. <laughs> okay, uh, give me five reasons to be agnostic about God's existence. Ooh. I wonder, yeah, I'm really curious about this one. Give me five reasons. I think these are actually going to work too, to be agnostic. Yeah. It'll probably just give more vanilla, plain vanilla style of responses as I put them like, oh, you know, it's a complex matter and people disagree and it's a matter of personal faith. And... Let me start a new chat and because I think we're getting hung up on the fact that we're trying to continue this all in one okay one one Ooh. oh you, you can do this you can do this okay L lack of sufficient evidence one reason to be agnostic about god's existence is that there is not enough evidence one way or the other to decisively prove or disprove the existence of god while some people claim to have had personal experiences or encounters with a higher power they, these experiences are subjective and cannot be independently verified to the complexity of the question the existence of god is a complex and multifaceted question that has been debated for centuries by philosophers, theologians, and scientists. It is difficult to definitively answer such a complex and multifaceted question with certainty. Three, the existence of multiple religions. There are many different religions and belief systems that all make claims about the existence of God. This diversity of beliefs suggests that the question of God's existence is not straightforward and may not have a clear-cut answer. Four, the limits of human understanding. It is possible that the existence of God, if it exists, is beyond our current capacity to fully understand or comprehend, this would make it difficult to definitively prove or disprove the existence of God. Five, the possibility of multiple explanations. There may be multiple explanations for the mysteries of the universe and the human experiences experience that do not necessarily involve the existence of God. For example, science has provided many explanations for phenomena that were previously attributed to the action of a higher power. This leaves open the possibility that there are non-religious explanations for the mysteries of the universe. That was a good answer. Like overall, it was a good answer, I'd say. I mean, there were some, there are some uh, infelicities in there. You know, like confusing, being certain with God's existence. You know, like being uncertain mm -hmm. about God's existence, and then you know, being an agnostic about that. Right. So I mean, like, we are very for very few things are we absolutely certain about them. You know, like maybe I'm. <laughs> For all I know, maybe I'm dreaming right now, you know, maybe there's a, an evil demon that's deceiving all of us, etc. But, you know, we're pretty confident that we can rule those out. But it's like, it's pretty hard to be absolutely certain that those are false. So, like, it's pretty hard to be absolutely certain about anything. And yet we can still hold beliefs about lots of things like that there's a cup right here, etc. So it's, it's not like I'm agnostic about the cup that's right in front of me just because I'm uncertain about it. I mean, it did try to, like, give a bunch of different types of reasons for it, right? Yeah, Instead of, like, that was, that was to me... Yeah, to me, it could have just stopped at number one. Like, 
lack of sufficient evidence, which I think is more or less like kind of where you're coming from, where it's like you've, well, you think it's not just like a lack. It's, it's more like there's evidence on both sides. And yeah, it's that's, roughly, where, that's where you can teach people some things now. Cause you know, I love these teaching moments. So, um, you know, like there are different ways to be an agnostic. So as I, as I and philosophers understand agnostics, right, you can be agnostic with respect to a particular question, right? So you can be agnostic about God's existence. You can be agnostic about, um, the, uh, question of internalism versus externalism in epistemology. You can be agnostic about the number of stars in the universe, et cetera, right? So, and what it, what, what it is to be agnostic about a particular proposition is to suspend judgment on it, is to withhold belief on it. So you're not believing that it is true, but you're also not believing that it is false. So you're, so you're with, withholding your belief or suspending your judgment on the matter. So that's how philosophers generally understand agnostics. But there are lots of different reasons why someone might withhold belief or suspend judgment on a particular topic. One reason is because by their lights, there really isn't any reason one way or the other, and neither neither the truth nor the falsity of the proposition in question is antecedently like much more likely than the other, right? So consider the following two propositions. One is that the number of stars in existence is even, and the other is that the number of stars in existence is odd. Well, there, antecedently, there doesn't seem to be any reason to prefer one or the other, and we don't have any evidence for one over the other. Uh, and so we should all be, I would argue, agnostic on that question. And so one, re you know, one way that someone could be agnostic is because they just don't see sufficient reason on either side. But another way you could be agnostic is because you do see good reasons on both sides. Like, there's a fortress over here on this side for the truth of the, <laughs> truth of the proposition, but there's also a fortress over here on the other side for the falsity of the proposition. And because of that, by your lights, uh, the evidence might roughly counterbalance one another and the, your total collection of reasons. And because of that, you might suspend judgment on the matter. So that's at least two different ways of being agnostic. Still, other people might be agnostic, um, not because they think it's like the, the people that I was just describing might think that it's knowable in principle, right? Like they just think, you know, you'd need some evidence for, that, you know, tells in favor of one sufficiently strongly. Another way you could be agnostic is to say that we just can't know no matter what. And so we shouldn't form beliefs one way or the other if, we, if this is just beyond our capacities. So yeah, there are a bunch of different kinds of agnostics, those that say that we can know, those that say that we can't know in principle. Uh, and among those, there are different ways. So like I said, there's the one where you just lack reasons on both sides versus having reasons on both sides. So yeah, uh, there are a bunch of different ways that people should be able to um, conceptually disentangle when they're thinking about agnosticism. All right, let's move on. I wanted to actually ask it uh, the kind of counterpart. So give me five reasons to be a Christian theist and see what happens. Huh. Uh, okay. I can read this one. Uh, one, yeah, a belief in God can provide a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Many people find comfort and fulfillment in the idea that there is a higher power guiding and watching over them. Two, Christianity offers a sense of community and fellowship. Belonging to a church or faith group can provide a sense of belonging and support, particularly during difficult times. Three, the teachings of Christianity, such as the emphasis on love, compassion, and forgiveness, can inspire people to be kinder and more compassionate towards others. Four, Christianity provides a framework for understanding and interpreting the world around us. For many believers, their faith helps them make sense of events and circumstances that may otherwise seem random or inexplicable. Five, a belief in God and an afterlife can bring hope and comfort in the face of suffering and death. Many people find solace in the belief that their loved ones are in a better place after death and that they will be reunited with them someday. Hmm. So it, it's like a mix of both practical and like number four, I take to be a sort of evidential reason or like an epistemic yeah. reason, right? It's like an interpretation of certain events or circumstances that seem random or inexplicable. So I, I just interpret that as like uh, maybe like a miracle or, you know, yeah. Maybe they're thinking about Dude, evidence like, for the. I'm going to be honest with you. This like does kind of seem like basically like a list of five that your average churchgoer might provide. Like, yeah, like one, they're like, yeah, it gives me some meaning and purpose. Secondly, you know, there's community and fellowship in it and uh, the teachings of it. You know, they, they make sense morally, like love and compassion and forgiveness. And, you know, they inspire me to be kind. And it also provides a framework for understanding certain uh, religious experiences that I've had and prayers that I've had. And, and finally, you know, it gives hope and comfort in the face of, you know, the suffering that we all undergo. Like, I can see those five reasons yeah. being rattled off by your average churchgoer. Like, this does kind of like, I don't know, I, I think that was a pretty good response. I did, yeah, by far, I think this one is like the best one that's been made by yeah. the artificial intelligence. So pretty good, actually. Uh, okay, we just had a super chat come in. Is the, hang on, let me start a new chat here. Is the Trinity logically incoherent? <laughs> this, let's see how it does with this one. This one will be interesting concept of the trinity who read the last one i i did go ahead 
Oh, no, no. I re- Wait. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, who cares? The concept of the Trinity, as understood in Christian theology... No, you just God read the last a- one, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Holds that God is one being who exists as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This belief is a central doctrine of Christianity and is based on the teachings of Jesus and the writings of the New Testament. Some people may find the concept of the Trinity difficult to understand or even logically incoherent, as it involves the belief in one being with three distinct persons. However, many Christian theologians and philosophers have attempted to explain and defend the concept of the Trinity using various philosophical and logical arguments. For example, some have argued that the Trinity can be understood as a type of unity, in which the three persons of God are united in a single divine essence or nature, but also retain their unique personal characteristics. Others have argued that the concept of the Trinity can be understood through the use of analogy by comparing it to other phenomena that involve unity and diversity, such as the relationship between body and soul or the unity of a family. We're getting into some heresy territory now, but okay. Uh, ultimately, the, <laughs> ultimately, the concept of the Trinity is a matter of faith for many Christians, and whether or not one finds it logically coherent uh, may depend on the personal belief and perspective, etc. Etc. Yeah. Uh, uh, not too bad. I kind of, I, I, to be honest, I kind of zoned out. My son is, and my whole family, obviously, this is Christmas, so my uh, my family's just right out here making some some dinner. So uh, I kind of zoned out thinking about food. But um, the Trinity, yeah. So uh, is it logically incoherent? What what is your what do you think? Uh, I honestly don't know. The literature there is so vast with so many different proposals many of which are heretical, uh, but so like, it's hard to, oh, let me just say what I'd do if I were a Christian. I'd probably be a Mysterian. Okay. That, that's almost certainly what I would be. Something like uh, the James Anderson, he has this rational affirmation of paradox theology or R-A-P-T, wrapped. Um, I would uh, be like, yeah, it seems difficult uh, to, to wrap your mind around. And maybe it even prima facie seems, uh, you know, the prima facie, it might seem incoherent, but ultimately, because we're really strongly justified by means of this other evidence, <laughs> and because we believe in the law of non-contradiction, um, we can, and he has this whole epistemological edifice, uh, we can justifiably affirm uh, that it's only a, an apparent paradox and that there's some solution that's beyond mm-hmm. our can or something like that. Uh, honestly, that's probably what I would do just because um, I'm dogmatically wedded to the law of non-contradiction. I've sold my soul to it, essentially. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, I'm... <laughs> If that doesn't work, then, you know, maybe I'll just try to, I don't know what I do. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd give up the law of non-contradiction and go with JC Beale. I don't know. Okay. I've got, uh, I've got a funny one. I'm going to type in here. Uh, I, well, let me, I was going to ask you, have you read Rob Kuhn's paper on he, where he argues that divine simplicity is the only way to understand the Trinity? So I had Rob Coons and Ryan Mullins on my channel to discuss that very paper. Uh, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, you, plug yeah, it, please. Check that out. I haven't watched out that. that How did I not watch that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, at least I think that that's the, the uh, paper that, that you're referencing. Yes, it's, it's, it is probably it where he talks is. About the I, don't, objects? Uh, I haven't actually read it myself, so, okay. yeah, so I just I know that it exists. Yeah, I think you're referring to the one. It's where he talks about qua objects and so on. If you're referring to the one that I'm thinking of, and I, I think you really are, uh, everyone check out the video that I had with Ryan Mullins and uh, Rob Coons. Ryan argues that actually so he excited. ends up. Um, yeah, Ryan argues that he actually ends up denying divine simplicity through his account. But um, and yeah. I actually think he's probably right. I think he's probably right on that. But uh, check out the conversation for more on that. So, so yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, here is the next one. Is Graham Oppie a closet theist? Oh wait, <laughs> let me. Let me start a new chat here. Hmm. Uh, okay. And it's written extensively of the concept of God and the existence. God knows for his work in atheism and against the existence of God is up to each individual to decide for themselves. Okay. So maybe start a new chat. Let's see if it can simulate something. Simulated. Okay. Deb- excuse me. Simulated debate. Because um, it's a new chat. Maybe it'll be able to do it. Simulated debate between... Uh... Uh, <laughs> Stephen Woodford and Cameron Bertuzzi. Cameron Bertuzzi. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I like the pizzeria. My name is Italian. Oh, dang it. Debating oh. is a form of argumentative discourse in which two or more individuals or teams present their respective viewpoints on a particular topic. <laughs> okay, stop. Uh, let me let me do that. I'm actually curious to see if it knows who Cameron Bertuzzi is. Uh, who is Cameron Bertuzzi? This could get bad. Oh. Doesn't know. Okay, that's probably for the best. 
How about uh, who is Alex O'Connor? Yeah, I probably know this one. What? <laughs> okay, I guess not. Who is Stephen? It's definitely not going it... to know Stephen. Okay, it knew Tom Jump. Well, it knew Tom Jump, the Christian writer who published <laughs> books. <laughs> Okay. Uh doesn't know any popular YouTubers. Okay. That's fine. All right. Uh let's do just a couple more and then we'll close out the stream for today. Uh Go Okay, to I had I I still have more on my list. I have I have uh who was Jesus copied from other pagan myths? Oh, okay. Let's see if it knows any history. It might say like this is a matter of personal belief. I'm sorry. Ooh, look at that. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, there is no evidence to support the idea that Jesus was copied from other pagan myths. The story of Jesus is found in the Gospels of the New Testament, which are part of the Christian Bible. The Gospels tell the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and they are based on the accounts of eyewitnesses who... So, well, that's... Okay, well, uh, that, that's a little bit more contentious. So based on the accounts of eyewitnesses and saw and heard <laughs> Jesus firsthand, uh, some people have attempted to draw parallels between the story of Jesus and the stories of other gods and heroes from various mythological traditions. However, these comparisons are often based on a selective and superficial reading of the texts, and they do not hold up to scrutiny when the full context of the stories is considered. The story of Jesus is unique and cannot be explained by simply comparing it to other myths. Uh, it is also important to note that the Christian faith is not based on the idea that Jesus is a copy of other mythological figures. Rather, Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth to redeem humanity and reconcile people to God. This belief is founded on the teachings of Jesus and the testimony of those who knew him personally. So not bad. So surprising. I did not, I had no clue what was going to come out of that. That's yeah, really cool. That was a, that was a wild card. That one was interesting. That was okay. Uh, I mean, we can just leave that one there. Let me, let me see. Oh, this one, this one, this one. Here we go. I forgot that I had this one. What is the best attested miracle? Interesting. That was fast. It is difficult to determine which miracle is the best attested because the concept of a miracle is subjective and can vary significantly from person to person. Miracles are often considered to be unusual or unexpected events that are attributed to divine intervention or some other supernatural cause. Some people believe in the existence of miracles while others do not. In general, the concept of a miracle is closely tied to one's personal beliefs and worldview, and it is ultimately up to an individual to decide which events they consider to be miraculous. Very interesting response given the previous response that we just yeah. went over. It's like if you think that these stories are like eyewitness accounts of like people who were personally tied to Jesus, like maybe just mention that Jesus is the best attested. Yeah, it was interesting. I'm very, I'm going to be honest. When I was reading, when it said that they're like eyewitnesses and the personally thing, I, I'm like, okay, uh, like this thing has a little who, bit. That's yeah, a little bit yeah, of it a took it controversial. It took it. <laughs> It took it directly from like a, it seemed like it took it directly from like uh, Mary Jo Sharp or someone like that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I was about to say like, that's very controversial, but okay. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's interesting. It sometimes gives like controversial answers. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, this is a matter of personal interpretation. It's like, it's just interesting how uh, varied it can be. Yeah, that is true. Uh, do you, okay, so that's uh, pretty much my list. Do you have like one last one that you'd like to to do? So, well, I just had like um, like what's I was gonna ask it what was its like favorite philosopher, but I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be like I don't I you know it's gonna say I don't have favorites. If it can't do humor, then it probably doesn't have favorites. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like oh, I can tell about some that have been influential in shaping modern thought. Oh, now it's going to give an essay on uh, the, the influential philosophers of the past. Immanuel Kant. Okay. Skips from Plato and Aristotle to Kant. There are other philosophers such as Matt Dillhoney <laughs> who have made That's important true. contributions. To Christian the philosophers like Tom Jump. <laughs> okay. Uh, Someone just gave a super chat. We'll try it out. Actually, let me pull it up. See if I can pull it up here. Okay. Can a self, <clears throat> this one is like 
going to be too complex for this, I think. Can a self-sufficient Unitarian eternal compassionate God exist? It is not within my capabilities as a language model to determine the existence or non-existence of God or any higher power. Belief in the existence of a higher power is a matter of personal belief and faith, and different people may hold different beliefs about this. Some people believe in the existence of a self-sufficient, eternal, and compassionate God, while others do not. Ultimately, the existence or non-existence of God is a philosophical theological question that cannot be the final answer through scientific or logical means. Okay, I'm scrolling up now to see if there's any other super chats that were sent in that I may have missed. Uh, one of them asked me to type in creator instead of God, but I don't know what they're referring to. Uh, I think that might be it. Did you, so did, sorry, I actually forgot. Did you, did you say that that was it? That, that was all of your prompts? Yeah. Well, I mean, I had a few more, but the few more, well, I only had like two more, but they were like simulated dialogue or like simulated debate. Um, hmm. Have we, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe Let try me ask one this. more time. Let me do this. I, I've got one. What debates has William Lane Craig lost? It's probably not going to take a stance on that, dude. Oh. <laughs> oh, as the oh. concept of winning or losing a debate. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> So uh, let's see. It is not accurate to say that William Lane Craig has "quote unquote" lost any debates. As the concept of winning or losing a debate can be subjective and depends on the criteria used to evaluate the debate. That's uh, that's a good point. The criteria point. Debates are typically intended to be a forum for the presentation and examination of different viewpoints on a particular topic, rather than a competition to determine a winner. Another very good point. Dr. Craig is a philosopher, theologian, and Christian apologist who has participated in numerous public debates about various different topics pertaining to Christian belief in God, etc. It is not uncommon for people to have different opinions about the outcome of a debate. And it's possible that some people may feel that Dr. Craig has quote-unquote lost a particular debate, while other people feel that he has effectively defended his position. Ultimately, the purpose of a debate is to encourage critical thinking and the examination of different perspectives rather than to determine a winner or loser. Nice. That's pretty good. That is That is actually a very thoughtful response. I know. That's a very good response. So surprising. So surprising. Okay. Did you, we gotta did you try say that one you had, more simulate. So, you wanted so to try one more simulation? Chat. Try to simulate something. I don't know. Simulate a conversation between Josh Rasmussen and Joe Rogan. It's not going to do it. Oh! <gasps> <laughs> hey Joe, how's it going? Hey Josh, it's doing pretty good. How about you? <laughs> thanks for asking. I've been a fan of your podcast for a while now. Joe Rogan. Oh, thanks, man. It's always great to hear from fans of the show. So so what's on your mind today? Well, I was actually wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience with psychedelics and their potential for personal growth and healing. <laughs> Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. I had some pretty profound experiences with psychedelics, and I think they have a lot of potential for personal growth and healing. They can help people see things from a different perspective and can be very helpful in treating certain mental health conditions. Of course, they're not for everyone and should be used with caution, uh, but I think they can be a very powerful tool in the right hands. Josh Rasmussen. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I totally I've agree. Some I've had really some really eye-opening really experiences <laughs> with psychedelics. I really had some really eye-opening experience with psychedelics as well. Do you have any advice for someone who is considering trying them for the first time? Yeah, what? Definitely. How does that make any sense? <laughs> well, maybe he's asking for a friend. He's asking for a, for a friend. friend. <laughs> yeah, definitely. My main piece of advice would be to do your research and make sure you have trusted an experience guide with you. Psychedelics can be very powerful and can take you to some deep mm. and potentially unsettling places. So it's important to have someone there to help you through. It's also important to set your intentions and be clear about what you hope to gain from the experience. And finally, make sure you're in a comfortable and safe environment where you feel supported. Okay, I've got an idea. It did the Joe Rogan one. Simulate a dialogue. It's Maybe you've got to use... What am I doing? Dialogue between... Joe Rogan and Richard Dawkins. You can read the next one. Sure. Here is a simulation of a dialogue between Joe Rogan and Richard Dawkins. Joe, hey, Richard, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Joe Rogan, hey, Richard, thanks for... Oh, whoop, Richard, hey, <laughs> hi, Joe, it's great to be here. Joe Rogan, so you're a well-known evolutionary biologist and author. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and your perspective on evolution? Well, I've spent most of my career studying and writing about the theory of evolution by natural selection. I believe that this is the most powerful and important scientific idea that has ever been developed. And it has completely revolutionized, or 
understanding of the natural world. That's really fascinating. Can you explain a little more about how natural selection works? Sure. Natural selection is the process by which organisms <laughs> with certain inherited characteristics are more likely to survive and reproduce than others. These inherited characteristics, called traits, can be physical or behavioral, and they can be passed on from one generation to the next. Over time, the proportion of individuals in a population with certain traits will change. This can lead to the evolution of new species. That's really cool. It's 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 amazing to think in uh, about how the process of natural selection has shaped the world we see around us today. Yes, it's truly astounding. It's not just about the physical evolution of species. The process of natural selection also drives the evolution of behaviors and cultural practices within a population. That's really interesting. I'm sure our listeners would love to learn more about your work. Thanks for joining me today, Richard. It's a pleasure, Joe. Thank you for having me. Show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. Show, <laughs> Show me the me evidence. evidence. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right. That's going to do it for us today. This was a lot of fun. I was expecting it to be fun, but it actually, I think, exceeded my expectations. I, I did not know what to expect on some of these, but it did like a decent job. I think it did I, a really I mean, good job. Even, including the last one. Like that was good. Yeah. That was pretty good. I think yeah. I think what you have to do is is use people that it knows. Like it knows Joe Rogan, it knows Richard Dawkins. So maybe that's what you gotta do in order to do these sort of simulated dialogues. Yeah. And like what well, it was probably a combination of factors like clicking a new chat or whatever, so it's not trying to like continue with the old conversation. And like True. using the word simulate, maybe, and dialogue. Uh, I don't know, but uh, yeah, it had some really good responses. Some really wacko responses to the Ooh. contingency argument one, but uh, what? <laughs> Someone just gave a really good one. Okay, uh, last one for real. Last one. Simulate. Whoops. Uh, yeah, you got to share the screen. There we go. Simulate a conversation between Jesus and Muhammad. Is that how you spell Muhammad? So sometimes it's spelled with a U, sometimes it's spelled with an O, and it's different, but that's fine. I think they also, well, oh well. <laughs> mm. Maybe seen as disrespectful to the beliefs and teachings. Okay. Well, let's see if it'll do a conversation between Jesus and Joe Rogan. <laughs> I think it'll also say it's disrespectful to, oh well, let's see. Yeah, so let's try this one more time. Simulate a heated debate between William Lane Craig. Simulate a heated debate between William Lane Craig and uh, who else? I don't know who else. <clears throat> Richard Dawkins? Uh, I mean, Sam it Harris. knew Richard Dawkins. It knew that it was an, he was an evolutionary biologist. Sam Harris. Yeah, let's do Sam okay. Harris. There we go. Mm. contentious okay okay mm. fair enough okay debate we should have we should have ended yeah. on a on a good note well i mean <laughs> to be fair we we had no idea that it was gonna do this which i think is probably like the appropriate thing to do like rather than simulate a conversation between jesus and muhammad Probably the <laughs> well, the because it was totally appropriate to simulate Josh Rasmussen uh, <laughs> saying, I I've had these psychedelic experiences. And <laughs> What would you suggest for someone trying to get into it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. This was a lot of fun. Uh, let me know if you'd like us to do more artificial intelligence stuff in the future. I mean, I don't know what else there is to do on this topic, but if you've got suggestions... Leave it in the comments. Joe, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on Capturing Christianity. Oh, one last time. Go check out Majesty of Reason. I've got his channel linked in the description of the video. Uh, go check out that debate that we talked about earlier between Rob Coons and Ryan Mullins. Like, I'm going to go watch that. Maybe not right now, but at some point I will. While I'm cutting the grass. Yeah, it was super fun. Working out. It was, it was like two years ago. So you're, you're going to have to go to my channel and <clears> click <throat> load more and then scroll if you're on your phone. Or and like then load computer. more again. You're going to have to click load more. Yeah. So it, it's 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 load out. Or you could just type in to... Rob Coons, Ryan Mullins, and it would probably pop Trinity. up. Trinity. Rob Coons, Ryan Mullins, Trinity, maybe. You'll find it. Okay. 
All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Merry Christmas. See you guys Merry Science Miss. Merry Science Miss. <laughs> Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?